What's going on, Star Wars fans? Welcome to the Resistance Broadcast. I'm John. Thanks for joining us. It's a Monday. I know, you're probably a little bummed out. You're like, man, the weekend flew by. Summer's ending. It's Monday. Ugh, God, whether you're going to school soon or work. <laughs> it's Monday. We all feel it. But that's why we're here to accompany you on your drive or whether you work from home or you're going to school, whatever. We're here to be with you to make your Monday a little better because we're here to talk Star Wars. And uh, with me, as always, is James and Lacey to do just that. And we have a pretty cool show. We're going to talk about a bunch of stuff, some look backs, some look aheads, uh, all about the latest Star Wars news. And uh, we're excited, as always. It's always a good time to talk Star Wars. Uh, if you don't have a good time talking Star Wars, what are you doing? Why are you here? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, James, yeah. what's uh, what's the deal, buddy? You got a little... It looks like it's like an an army camo shirt, but it's clearly Star Wars. Uh, what's mm -hmm. the deal with that getup you have there? For for our audio listeners, obviously, our YouTube listeners look how can see how uh, handsome you look wearing that shirt today. <laughs> but for our audio listeners, why don't you explain what's going on with this uh, army green Star Wars button-up you got cracking? Um, and this isn't an ad either. I'm just interested. Well, what's funny is it almost was an ad. Uh, oh. We were sent the shirt to do an ad for the company. And then they sent it, and when I the day I got it, they said, "Actually, we're tying, we're we're cutting our ties with Lucasfilm, so don't don't bother to do the ad. <laughs> just just keep the shirts, have fun, no. <laughs> don't Man. do anything." And I was like, "Cool." <laughs> what did did Benioff and Wise create the shirt by any chance? Why? Oh, because they cut ties. Because they there it is. Yeah, <laughs> got my fastball today, baby. <clears throat> is that the uh? Resvolts company? No. Resvolts? It was, I'll just say it because, you know, they didn't want an ad, but it was original Stitch. Oh, right. So oh, my little right. sister, this yeah. is kind of mm -hmm. a plug on my little sister. She's doing designs for that other company that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. She did a Lion King one mm. and a SpongeBob one. And mm. uh, what else did she do? She did some other pop culture type stuff, but it's like such a proud sister moment for me because I'm like, she did a SpongeBob shirt, officially licensed. That's pretty cool. Yeah. She, she did a design for us too. They got taken down. She <laughs> did. It was too yep. good. Too good. Sure proud did. sister. <laughs> Cheers to the four people who were able to buy that shirt before they sniped us. <laughs> but people did get stickers of it at Celebration, so it they did, did go to use. They did. We got to start doing shirts where we just t rip off pictures from J.W. Rinsler books and put them on a white t-shirt. Yeah, copyright what, pictures. John, you always that's bring the that ticket. up. What, what, what we should do is we should just do like the B-rate, like the knockoff character kind of thing. <laughs> like it's not Baby Yoda. It's uh, Child Yada or something <laughs> like that. And it's like... Blue, blue Chaka. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a little off. Just do Chewy, but he's blue. And he looks yeah. the generic version or whatever of all, all yeah. the characters. We're like, yeah. that is not a copywritten character. <laughs> oh, my own. Um, all right. Well, that's cool. Lacey, what what's going on with you? How are you doing? You uh you were you were off this week. So that's from, from your real day job. So that's that's pretty cool. I was off for a little bit, yeah. Went yeah. to the beach. Hate the beach. Right. I hate sand, which is not even a joke. It's serious. <laughs> I do not like sand. But D describe how it feels. Would you say it's coarse and it gets everywhere, which <laughs> is a real thing. That is a real line. Yeah. George Lucas was telling the truth because it is. I hate the beach. I hate. Do you it. know if you if you bring a magnet with you and put it all over your body, it takes it attracts the sand, takes the sand off your body. Are you being honest right now? Is no, this like I a birthday no. thing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to see Lacey take like one of those shoehorn magnets, <laughs> those big old school red ones to the beach and have people watch her doing this. <laughs> I would be the but stupid person it. that would do it. I'd be like, oh, so-and-so said this. Mm -hmm. I should have held on to that. That would have been so great. That would have been so great. Oh, and then man. you would have gotten right. a text of me being like, how dare you? Right, right. <laughs> Well, no, but it was a good time off just to to get away for a little bit. Um, I did just have time off because I had COVID, but this was actually enjoyable. So yeah, um, yeah, I went to I went to the beach too. We went away for a long weekend, and uh, my kids got to go into the ocean for the first time, and Ooh. there were like a lot of jellyfish. So I was like, trying yeah, to dodge jellyfish gross. in the ocean. And, yeah, that's not. Good. But we saw dolphins. We saw pods of dolphins, and of course, some moron takes his paddleboard out there and scares them away. 
but uh did everybody boo him no he just like it was whatever but uh they were about Mm -hmm. 50 feet out so you really got to see them coming out of the water and stuff but that that was pretty cool my kids got a real kick out of it i had crepes over my vacation like (laughs) crepes crepes Mm -hmm. like the french food crepes oh crepes yes and (laughs) i have a bit of an obsessive personality that when i find something i really like i like go all in and i know that's weird for people to understand but Mm -hmm. so (laughs) the first day we got crepes they were so good we then got them every day no yeah totally so what i had crepes one day Oh my gosh, James. They had a baking and cheese crepe. Oh, yeah. They had okay. they peanut butter, Nutella, and banana crepes. Mm-hmm. Then I had a California crepe, which was like chicken and broccoli and avocado. <laughs> also with the banana, Nutella, peanut butter. I got one that mm-hmm. one every single mm-hmm. time. I had a lot of crepes on <laughs> vacation. Um, they're basically my new favorite Any, food. Anytime anybody ever says crepe, I immediately go to Ricky Bobby. <laughs> And the whole thing with like, say you like crepes. <laughs> and he's like, oh. I don't even know what that is. And he's like, it's it's basically a pancake, like a really thin <laughs> pancake. And he's like, it's kind of a good offer, man. You should probably take it. And he's like, I do kind of like crepes. So those, yeah, all right. And, and he's, like, he's like, no, I will no, break I'm not gonna your arm. It. I'm not going to do oh, it. Oh, when he, he breaks, breaks his, his arm. arm. Yeah. He's just trying to get yeah. him to say so that he likes something French. French. <laughs> yeah. And he's like, it's a good compromise, man. I mean, we've had just... those crepes before. They're really good. You like them. <laughs> and he's like, well, do you guys watch? Say it. You got... Lacey, you watch Seinfeld, right? Yeah. The episode where they get the Dominicans to, who are good at rolling cigars to roll the crepes and they mm. roll them too tight and they burn everybody's face. <laughs> 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 oh, man. What a show. Um, Go get right, a crate. We're... That's basically the moral story. But mm-hmm. oh, so the get point crates. of my right. story was for get our Patreon Q and A's. We once had a question of like what our last meal would be, and I've always said, oh, it's steak or a cheeseburger or whatever. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. is a banana Nutella peanut butter crepe <laughs> from Sunshine go. Crepes in Delaware. All right, that would be it. Sponsor the pod. <laughs> She's all right. on the crepe uh, train. Yeah. <laughs> and now our audience is like, all right, you made me hungry. Yeah. Uh, now I'm even more pissed off that it's Monday. When Tell are you going to talk about Star Wars? Crepe. Tweet at me and, or write in the comments. Great. And the answer to that question is right now. It's the resistance. Uh, guys, guess what happened? the fan expo boston and how those all of those things go is they pull in all sorts of people uh from different shows and different things like that and uh we actually got a couple star wars people showing up doing interviews things like that we actually kind of have two stories here to talk about the first of which is ming na wen uh for multiple shows that she's been on you know agents of shield being one of them uh but of course uh book of boba fett um she was asked by a fan um you know hey what do you think the chances are of the second season of the book of boba fett and she said i hope i never count my chickens before they hatch because in the business you just never know but knock on wood they'll be announcing that soon um I don't know. It's kind of interesting the way she phrased that. What do you think, John? Do you think that this is kind of a confirmation of the book of Boba Fett? Or do you think it's a very loose, loosey goosey uh, version of like, I hope that wouldn't that be great? Um, Man, that's tough. I, I don't know what they have like set up for next year for filming in California in the volume. It looks like it should be pretty open because there's no confirmation on Mandalorian filming this fall for another season yet, as far as I understand it. Um, and then, you know, uh, Acolyte's filming in UK, I think, so that's out. Uh, Andor's filming in UK. Then you start crossing off all these shows, and Skeleton Crew's already filming. And then you start thinking like, well, what else? The, like, what else is coming then? Because now we're starting to enter that whole that that year, that 2023, where we were all talking about about all these shows are coming. Before you know it, it's it's you know it's gonna be here. It's right around the corner. We're four months away from twenty twenty three. I I would think if they were close to, or putting together, like they would have to be putting it together now. Mm-hmm. So she would have to be in the know 
So if there is going to be a book of Boba Fett season two, she would know by now already, I would think, because they'd be writing it and, and all that stuff. And I don't think she um, would have mentioned it. Right. And she did the whole knock on wood thing. The, my whole thing with book of Boba Fett is I, you know, I don't not like I, I don't I don't like saying the whole I don't need it thing. Um, but I haven't gone back and rewatched book of Boba Fett. And it's the only one that I haven't revisited any episodes of. Um, so I, I do want to dunk back into it. They clearly left it open with the Cobb Vanth thing. Um, so, I mean, what if they, what if it's not Book of Boba Fett? What if it just continues the story and they call it, you know, the, the outlaws of Tatooine or, you know, something, you know, but I know they need to be SEO conscious and put a name on it. Um, but they left it open with Cobb Vanth sort of taking over in a way and that frees Boba Fett to go do other stuff. So if they do do Book of Boba Fett, maybe he doesn't have to be sort of trapped on Tatooine, so to speak, and he can go back to being the Boba Fett we love because Tamara Morrison was outspoken about it. Mm-hmm. He seemed to not love a lot of the, you know, peace pipe Tuscan Raider stuff. Like he wanted Boba Fett to kick people's asses <laughs> and we didn't get a ton of that in this show. Mm-hmm. So uh, if the actor's saying it, I think it's fair for, for us fans to admit that some of that stuff may have fell a little flat with us. Um, and I know some people love the Tuscan Raider stuff the most and, and that's totally cool too. You know, it, I'm not here mm-hmm. to, stomp on other people's joy um but i would think if something was going to be happening they'd have to know by now because they'd have to get this you know things like i said they'd have to start writing this stuff um so if she doesn't know and it's earnest her answer then we're not seeing that for at least a couple years and then that gets a little interesting like does it get too far removed where people like i don't really care you know about book above that now i forgot what what happened in that series again you know um and Favreau's so tied into it, so then you're like thinking, like, how how long is he going to be involved now? You know, he's got to wrap up the Mando story. Is Boba Fett a part of the the culmination stuff that they've been talking about? I think there's too many questions to be asked. Have they um, mentioned that again? This is kind of a sad. Well, it, they 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 haven't mentioned it from a Lucasfilm perspective, but the way Filoni and Favreau talk about the shows they're working on, mm-hmm. they use the word interconnected a lot, and and mm-hmm. that sort of mm-hmm. that sort of stuff. Um, I'm just saying I remember no... when they first did the investor day they mentioned it with Kathleen had said it was building up to this big event yeah, they've yeah. never mentioned that event yeah. ever again right I know it, and I, I would think and who knows what happens with Rogue Squadron like it's still on the schedule for December 23 2023 which is hilarious at this point <laughs> um, it's obviously not happening uh, like what if they did a big budget thing and, and let Favreau make the movie out of all that, but who knows? But I, I'm getting away from the point. I don't. I don't know about Book of Boba Fett. I don't think she's lying. Uh, so I, I think if there is a Book of Boba Fett, it's it's a little ways off. And I think you know Lucasfilm puts their ear to the ground pretty closely when it comes to online feedback and and fan reactions. And I don't think people loved Robert Rodriguez that much mm-hmm. as a showrunner. So that's another discussion that would have to be had. And maybe it's one of those things where Favreau's like, no, it's his or nobody. So maybe those type of that type of tug of war is happening, and this is all me speculating. But I don't know if, if she if she's fibbing, um, they would have they would have to be getting something going for that thing to arrive anytime mm-hmm. in the next year or two. So mm-hmm. so ass- assuming that the the culmination event is still happening, it makes me think that she's not done playing me now when, or I'm sorry, she's not done playing Fennec Shand, right? So she is probably uh, I hope she's not done being Ming Yeah, bad. yeah. She's probably <laughs> in talks and filming things and doing things and she knows what the contract is. When she gets brought with this question, she's like it's easy for her to kind of dodge it cuz she's like, I don't know, season 2 or more, or whatever, but she knows she's still going to be continuing to play this character. If I had to guess, I don't know, the fan reaction wasn't great with Book of Boba Fett. But I think, like you said, they set it up where he could leave the planet now. And I think that gives, um, you know, Favreau and everybody else like a little autonomy to do more with that book, with that character for Tamara, yeah. for the fans, everything and make him what it is. Mm-hmm. And they still want to continue to use him because it's all going to be it's all interconnected. So I kind of lean that they are probably are working on a season two. And then if you think like just just think in your head, oh, that's happening. That's already confirmed. And then re-listen to her comments. It makes sense. Where she says, like, knock on wood, they should be announcing that sometime soon. And it's like, we have Disney Plus Day coming up. We have um, D23 coming oh, yeah. up. And yeah. also, I think uh, you know this better than I do, Lacey, and I'm going to get to you here in a second. 
when is that also the the investors day that we just probably the mm-hmm. biggest thing Lucasfilm has ever announced since we're doing 7 8 and 9 like that big huge day aren't we are we not coming up on that too again or that was November of 2020 yeah so so I don't know if we've had... had another one since then have we I don't think they did another one uh, what a time. weird thing to have Investor's Day, and it was one day random. Well, the weird thing was is that we always go back to this. It's like all the big announcements that have ever come out, generally speaking, have been related to stakeholders or investors or something tied to money. Like it's right. not by Lucasfilm's own <sighs> announcing. It's like Disney forcing their hand. Um, these comments from Ming-Na Wen, to me, seem like, she's trying to initiate that fan push for it. Like she's trying to get the troops together to be like, hey, we really want another season. Um, and in, in building off what John was saying about um, Robert Rodriguez, fans didn't like what he did. I, I, I enjoyed the season, but most fans didn't like what he did. But I wonder what the reception was internally of what he did. Hmm. Uh, Cause they stood by what, they put out so i would assume that they actually did get they would give him the job again like he was sort of a ryan johnson in the sense of like yeah fans they would, maybe didn't click with it but they were like we got robert rodriguez and it was awesome yeah like <laughs> we bob chapek well. is coming back for multiple years and people don't like him so sure. like i i always find it interesting that like no matter what the fan slash customer reaction is internally they tend to do whatever they want anyway like very rarely are they gonna be like no we're not doing this what if Lucasfilm um, is handling the Fantastic Four? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but that being said, I, I, I would love to see her back as Fennec Shand. Mm-hmm. I would be someone that would be happy to watch A Book of Boba Fett Season 2. I don't know what the story there is because I feel like his story's been told. And like John said, you know, Tem was very clear that he was like, I want to get back to the Boba that we know, that we like really enjoy, which is like kicking butt and taking names and like yeah you know being a bounty hunter you which say it's been I, told i'm saying i'm just getting started baby like that's the him <laughs> yeah. to me i meant point. like what's been told as a solo adventure mm-hmm. like his point of view i think he shines best when he's part of a group or when he's a part of another story and that's not to uh belittle what he's done as yeah. an actor or what the character means to star wars it's just to say that some characters are just better when they play the villain in someone else's story or they play the supporting character to another character. Mm-hmm. Everything he's done with Mando has been awesome, and I would love to see more of that. I just don't know what other stories there are to tell now that he's now done with the Tatooine thing and done with what happened during that gap, which was what we needed to know as fans of what happened. That's been told. We can move forward now. And I don't know if we need a season two. I know John's like, I don't like to say that. I'm going to say it. I don't know if we need a season two. Will I watch it? Absolutely. But mm-hmm. uh, I think I would like to see him more in the next season of Mando. Because if you do a Book of Boba Fett season two, then what is that? Mando season 3.5? Mando season 4.5? Because that's what how John Favreau had described it. I'm yeah, a, unless I'm was okay with it all blurring together. I don't really, yeah. Yeah. that doesn't bother me. I, I just, yeah. I, I'm going to start thinking of them as, um, okay, yeah, you're calling it Mandalorian season three, but this is just the next chapter in all of these characters. I'm, I expect to see Ahsoka. I expect to see Boba Fett. I expect sure. to see the Mandalorian. I just think like, if you're going to put like, if you're going to say which of the three characters out of, out of those are going to get mm-hmm. the most screen time, it's called Book of Boba Fett because he gets the most screen time. Like That's kind of sure. one of those things. It's going sure. to mostly focus on him for this chapter of I would stress that he didn't get story. the most screen time on some episodes. Who would have gotten the more, most screen time? There's a whole episode where he doesn't show up and it's just Mando. That's not what I'm talking about, though. I'm saying the series as a whole, Boba Fett had the most screen time out of any character. Yeah. Right? Mando was only sure. had the, was the, only the focus of one episode or one and a half episodes, but Boba Fett was the focus of like 
But five don't think for a is. second that Lucasfilm isn't aware that like most fans liked the Mandalorian episode the best. Oh, the whole that, season. yeah. But again, that's not that that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying this is the, this is a chapter with all the characters involved. Like, sure. You know, it's just that we're calling this chapter of it the book of boba fett because most of these episodes are going to be based around this portion of boba fett's life it's like he's gonna be disney the buys here. lucasfilm in 2012 and you go to a fan and say just listen to me right now they're gonna create a new mandalorian character and He's gonna. They're gonna make a whole show about Boba Fett, and people are gonna like that new guy better than Boba Fett. People would lose <laughs> it. What? I'm Get out of here. I might be dumb right now. Why was it called Book of Boba Fett? Did we ever figure that out? Did it? Did it ever have a? What do you mean? Like what was like the there was no book the title? Like is what you're saying. Yeah, or like, what was? Well, it? isn't like I, I there's that's like a, a naming convention. Uh, the book of like the book of Eli, like the book of life. It's almost like his book of Henry, te- his testament. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, like his his testament or something. I guess that's you okay. know nothing more than that. Um, I'm just because yeah. I remember before the show came out, we were all like, "What does the book mean?" Rah, 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 rah. And yeah, now I'm like looking yeah. back on it, and I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> See, it's yeah. funny that I'm using uh, that I use the term chapter when the when the name of the thing is book, but like I always kind of thought of it as like we're telling this story, and this portion of the story is about the Mandalorian, and this portion of the story is about Boba Fett. You know, it's sure. his chapter, it's his portion. Sure. Yes, there are characters that intertwine, like Boba Fett was in Mandalorian, now Mandalorian's in Boba Fett. You know what I mean? It's like Yes, that's going on, um, but I like I think the section of these six episodes, the release of these, you know, I think it was seven actually seven episodes, right? Mm-hmm. Are mm-hmm. Boba Fett focused? Because even when we put the Mandalorian in there, he's still going to come back and finish the story with Boba Fett. That's what that we only put that in there so that episode seven made sense. Mm-hmm. So it's like okay, you know, and I I understand that. So. Book yeah. of Boba Fett season two to me is just sort of Mandalorian season four or this bigger story season six or wherever we're at, you know, however you want to look at it. Um, mm-hmm, but anyway, mm-hmm. let's let's get on to the next story here. And this is, again, another one coming out of the Fan Expo in Boston. Uh, Ian McGregor was there and he revealed that Did Obi-Wan- you say Boston? Boston. I said cockies. Anyway. Um <laughs> Ewan McGregor was there, and he revealed that the Obi-Wan Kenobi pitch, the original pitch, was supposed to be about Obi-Wan and Luke, right? Um, as he kind of reveals, he, he was like, okay, it was supposed to, you know what I mean, it was supposed to be, and that's what everybody thought. And then suddenly, at some point, somebody came up with the idea of, like, why don't we just make it about the other sibling, and that could get him off planet and all this other stuff. And then he said it was sort of like a light bulb for the script. That's just made so much more sense than making it originally about Luke, but they were sort of stuck on Luke for a while until the Leia option came up, and then it just felt like it was free going from there. Um, but also in that interview, he talked a little bit, and we can pick and choose which one we, we think is you know fun to talk about, but he mentions Liam Neeson and the return of Qui-Gon, specifically about how he got to work with them and how it was so great back in the day and he couldn't believe he was doing it. So of course, like, he absolutely loved the fact that he was involved in Obi-Wan Kenobi and he got to do that scene with him and just how it was sort of a blessing. And I, I correct me if I'm wrong here. Did he also not say like, and it would be great if we did more, you know, and he came back or anything like that. No, but I think that's part of the speculation of he's been on that train for a little while of like Kenobi season two, let's do it. Right. And <laughs> so all of this is sort of like, man, wasn't it great when I got to work with, um, Liam Neeson again, you know. So, uh, Lacey, what are and your every thoughts? Every movie, every movie Liam Neeson does now takes place on a train. So it works out perfectly <laughs> yeah. for everybody. Lacey, what are your thoughts on Ewan McGregor's thoughts? Did either one of the two stories stand out, or or wh- what? What are you going with? He's wicked smart guy. <laughs> um, this makes total sense, and I'm really glad that they didn't do the Luke thing because going into Obi Wan Kenobi, I think all three of us and other fans as well. We're concerned on how it was going to play into the overall story of Star Wars and going into A New Hope, what was going to get changed. 
Um, and there was a little bit of like, oh, you're getting a little close to like what we hold near and dear, which is the original trilogy, which is like the movie that started all of this. You can't, you know, retcon stuff or change things because that goes against everything that we fell in love with. Um, so there was a little bit of hesitancy as fans of like, okay, how are they going to tackle this? So I'm really glad they did go away from the Luke stuff because it just gets a little too close. I feel like the way that they did handle the stuff with Leia was perfect. I think the way it ended was perfect. The way that he kind of was like, hey, you got to keep this between us. You can't let anybody know that we know each other. That then goes into the next movie perfectly so that it explains why she acts like she doesn't know him, that she's reaching out to him, that kind of thing. Um, as for the Liam Neeson stuff, it's wonderful to hear him talk about Liam, and I I love hearing you and talk about any actor because he just is such a positive person and such a, a warm and, and loving and giving person that I feel like any time any other actor is brought up, he has such wonderful things to say about them, which of course, who wouldn't uh, say nice things if they're in an interview, but I just feel like he goes that extra step to 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 really compliment people and it 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 goes to show how good of a person he is. Um it is interesting that he says he gets to work with him again right at the end because that's when we do see him in the episode. Um I am still waiting to hear though Liam Neeson's response about being in the show because we all talked about his terrible interview lunch. <laughs> was oh, it Jimmy Kimmel when he was like mm-hmm. I don't what what is what? Um, him saying he wasn't a part of the show and there he was. And everybody's like, it's kind of a no-brainer that you're a part of the show. Yeah, he said he wasn't approached, which that was like the dumbest thing he could have said. <laughs> and then he like pulled out his lights and he's like, but I have this. And then wasn't there another interview where he's like <laughs> scheduling conflicts? It's like, dude, pick a lane. <laughs> like you're on the lying highway. Just pick a lane and stay in that, pick, that lane. Pick a lane, Liam. Yeah. Stop Get back on the train. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, oh, you have to stop this train. It's out of control. <laughs> and I only talk on cell phones. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, it, it's great to hear him talking about working with Liam. I think everybody has this kind of nostalgic uh, kind of hug feeling when they think about them together again. Because it, I love The Phantom Menace. I don't care what anybody says. It's my favorite of the prequels. I really love that movie in big part because of Liam and Ewan's relationship and them working together. So it was great to see them on screen together again. And I hope we do get to see them at some point together. I'd love to even just get an interview with them together. I'm surprised they haven't done that yet of like a round table after the series has come out of what everybody thought. Um, Cause it's one thing to hear the actors before the series come out, but like now that everybody knows everything, it would be great to get those reactions mm-hmm, after mm-hmm. the fact. Yeah, I I did a quick look up here just to see if he's got any movies coming up. It doesn't say when they come out, but he has three projects in post-production. So he might be, you know, like if he's asked about, like if he's coming on the show to do something for that movie, he might get, Mm -hmm. it might go, hey, and you got to be, uh, you know, Qui-Gon Jinn again. But what Mm -hmm. is interesting here, and I don't know, is this confirmed or not, but like it says that he's part of Tales of the Jedi. Yeah, he's doing the voice. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So then there might Very also cool. be it might also be that you know he does something for that too, and that covers both bases. Like I've always loved playing Qui Gon Jinn. Got to play him in this. Got to do you know now I'm back at it again. I don't know. Mm-hmm, maybe mm-hmm. he also could. It, that doesn't seem like it's a crazy thing. So I was I was look looking up those like and he's like this is like the twilight of his career in a sense. Like if you look at the stuff he did in the early 90s and stuff is when he really like showed what he's all about but like looking at his like recent movie titles it's like it's like the stuff bruce willis was doing it's just like it looks (laughs) like some lazy person just like named these movies and and like so many of them are about like cold temperatures he he's in one 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 now is called in post-production called cold storage he has another movie called ice road cold pursuit like what's with liam neeson and cold and and then it's like the commuter Honest Thief, Ice Road, Blacklight, Memory. It's like, does someone just like, Dark open building. a dictionary <laughs> and like, like, just like throw a dart at it and be like, this movie's called Broccoli, <laughs> starring Liam Neeson. I don't get it. So, it's, uh, and to my point, like, everyone knew he was coming back because he's not, you know, look at these movies he's been doing. 
Yeah. Dark well, tunnel. So, so anything <laughs> else, John? What about you? What about the thoughts on Leia? Yeah. Um. I. He's think, like, all oh, right. We were actually yeah. getting points now. <laughs> I, I think there are blurred lines to this whole thing because I think the movie element still plays a big factor here, and I think when this was a movie, it was all about Luke. And I think they probably didn't want to touch the whole Leia thing because of the continuity. And then they had to really stretch it out. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how do you turn a show where he's protecting a boy on this desert planet and he's not supposed to leave into like a six episode thing? So they're probably like, we got to we got to rethink this whole thing. And that's where the Leia thing came in. That's my guess. Um, so I think him saying and, you know, sometimes if you notice in interviews, I think there were a couple of times where he referred to this series as a movie. Um, so I think sometimes like. He may even be blurring the lines of when what was pitched when. But my guess is when all these things that seemed simpler in the early uh, iterations and Stuart Beatty, obviously the original writer, talking about it uh, quite candidly, I think that was all just the movie stuff and they had to really stretch things out and complicate things in order to fill the time that is involved with making a series. Right, um, right. So I think I think the Luke stuff was mainly for when this was a movie when they initially went to create a series out of it they probably tried to do a lateral move and say let's take this story stretch it out and kathleen kennedy or somebody looked at it and they were like this is thin like this doesn't we got to rethink this whole thing and that's when they bring in the other writers and the other ideas and that's when the leia thing came in that's my guess on how that whole thing went down mm -hmm. and as far as liam neeson like in all seriousness, like he's yeah, legendary actor. Uh, he was amazing in the Phantom Menace. Um, I I still really enjoy his his part there, and what he he brought to uh, the franchise. And uh, I liked seeing him back. And and if they do bring it back, he he's obviously again, it's gonna be one of those things where hopefully he's not like, oh, I don't know. Hopefully he's like, yeah, I'm I'm in. Like give me give me the Stellan Skarsgård answers at this point, Liam. Like don't <laughs> don't make this. A, it'd be so stupid if he's like. I'm filming the refrigerator too. I can't make it to Obi Wan Kenobi. <laughs> Freezing <season two>. train. <laughs> the, yeah. the building a snowman seven. I can't. I can't Wasn't make he it in to the Toby. snowman. <laughs> no, I don't think. Oh, okay. No. Um, or it's like snow piercer er. <laughs> snow piercer. -er. Yeah. Snow pierced yeah. again. Um, and Jack Frost too. My son builds a snowman, and I become him. James, you got to do that only on Disney Plus. <laughs> only on Disney Plus. Um, no, the the Leia thing is interesting to me. Okay, so they have all these scripts, they have these all all these ideas of what they wanted to do with Luke, and then at some point they're like, man, but it just doesn't seem like kind of adventurous enough for like our our big comeback for Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, plus when we're thinking of it, like you said, Lacey, as fans is like, how does that kind of interrupt the story? Right. Of like, does Obi-Wan interact with Luke that often? Um, mm -hmm. the interesting thing though, is if Obi-Wan Kenobi, the show ended the way that it did, where he was sort of able to be like, hello there to Luke, maybe they're reworking versions of the original script of Obi-Wan and Luke into the second season of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Because the story of him hanging out with Luke wasn't, it was very clear in the first season that he was not able to hang out with Luke. So now as they maybe start to work on like, well, what did we have before that we thought maybe was kind of working? Maybe it works now a little bit differently that we did already have him leave the planet and recover his internal stuff. Maybe we can rework some of those ideas that we had of him and Luke now that we're we're seeing that Owen is allowing Kenobi to interact with young Luke. Maybe that yeah. is the maybe that's a little bit of the driving force. Maybe that's why he's talking about it because it's relevant again. Like, oh, well, our original stories, what we our our dream story was Kenobi and Luke, right? And then it's like eight months from now when they announce season two or whatever, then he's like, remember I was talking about Obi-Wan and Luke? This one's all Obi-Wan and Luke. Like we, we, we figured it out, you know, or whatever. Well, if you, it would if you explain at... why Luke gets so upset when Kenobi dies. No! 
<laughs> yeah, it would explain that because that's something that always stood out to me when I was and like it's a meme, you know, it's like, oh, my whole planet blew up, but you're this old guy died. So sorry for you. With, with Leia. On the flip side, it does make it look like Leia's cold because they really built up that connection in the Kenobi show. And, and she, she like he dies and she just walks up the ramp on the Falcon like no reaction. I think she just has been so exposed to war that she we're gonna have to find ways to explain i know yeah but but the, uh, the luke other thing, thing he gets so upset like, yeah. like straight up sucks <laughs> she just sucks. uh i she is his always mom. yeah i always thought that was just a weird thing where it was like why is he so upset like i get that it sucks that like someone that he knows but he didn't even get that upset about owen and baru yeah um well the other thing about A New Hope when I was thinking about it was when Luke wakes up from getting knocked out, he immediately recognizes Obi-Wan, and he's an older Obi-Wan, and he says, boy, am I glad to see you. So it's not like one of those like standoff, yeah. like, I'm not yeah, sure yeah, about yeah. this guy. I met yeah. him like 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, he's, they've spent time together. That's boy, a, that, am I that's glad a, that's to see establish. you. Yeah, yeah. Boy, am I glad to see you. Um, so they, they, they can... If they made the first season of Obi Wan work, they'll figure out a way to make it work. Yeah. It's gonna annoy people, purists and stuff, but I, I have faith they'll make it work. Um, you made a good point last episode, Lacey. Whether oh my god, I did. Deb- Just stop. Yeah, every time I say that, you <laughs> no, say that. No, no, no. Every, yeah, every time I say time. I agree with you and Will of the Force, you go. <laughs> what am I? A, a character from Team America? World yeah, Police? I don't game know. For Why do you do audience? it like that? Why Lips do you do it like that, John? To, That's what I'm saying. This. <laughs> oh god anyway my, my point is uh that whether deborah child would come back or not and you know i i'm not blaming deborah child for for obi-wan i think it was a budgetary thing but i wouldn't if if they were like blank is directing season two obi-wan i wouldn't be like oh no we're screwed you know what i mean yeah so i think it'd be all right like it it, it it's it's at that strange spot where you're like a fresh take could be nice it's not like well, yeah, i'm did so watch... loyal because that was mm-hmm. so great you know it like, could only if be we're deborah be, if right. we're being honest did, did anyone watch sad. obi-wan kenobi and say like oh my god what an unbelievable job they did directing this well it had to be good <laughs> i'm just <laughs> <eating it. laughs> I, I thought it was good i'm it just saying good. like it was good um, yeah, all right, let's we're move not on talking to... about the Godfather. <laughs> Let, let's move. On. It has to be good. All right, total film has the strongest, probably exclusive for Andor content, even more than like you know EW and and Empire and all these other magazines because they just keep putting out all these photos. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit about them. Do you guys? Do you have any uh thoughts on? some of the content that they've been putting out on their articles, like, Hey, here's a little, another snippet here. Here's two photos. Here's another two photos. They're kind of dropping a lot this, uh, this week, last week. Um, John, do you have any thoughts on the total film, uh, rollout, uh, r- the road to Andor, if you will, as they used to say. Before John it's, gets started, this yeah. is actually the character, James, that you kept asking us in our breakdown of the trailer, uh, yeah, like who it was. So it's really yeah. funny that they, they released this. I was like, that is the exact character that James was like, who because is I, this guy? We're doing the breakdown yep. of the trailer, yep. and I'm like, are we not going to talk about this guy? <laughs> I feel like he's like very important, and yet we seem to be like treating Cyril him like he's Karn. just a random guy. Cyril Karn yeah. is the guy's mm-hmm. name. And yeah. it looks like his mother is involved in the story Edie too, Karn. and yep. his relationship with, which is interesting too, because we've talked about this, Lacey, like the mother relationship, like maybe sometime. This is a we, very different take on the mother relationship. We yes. let the mother be the only one that, and and in this case, she's kind of taking like the aggressive role of like you have to be perfect, and so it's he's the always creepy, looking for that. It's the creepy mother son relationship. Yeah, you know, the he's ones always that you looking see, for that like, approval. Ugh kind of thing um but it also brought up james it's like they heard our episode they brought up the imperial security bureau which are those Mm -hmm. blue guys that you had brought up like who are these blue guys which is weird to me because they i saw in the article that they referred to them as isb members and i'm like that those aren't isb uniforms so this just must be new Mm -hmm. I, i like i would have never thought that was isb but that's why we kept saying they look like some sort of local police department because it de- it barely even looks Empire. 
to me. Yeah. Let alone like the ISB, which is sort of like the CIA of mm-hmm. the of Star Wars. They seem right. to be a little upper tier and very like ruthless uh members of the Empire or something like that. John, any thoughts on uh the, the article, the photos, uh new character reveals, anything like that? Tony Gilroy, I mean, the f- your boy. Yeah. Yeah. Um <laughs> the the photo of them at the table it just like just very like seventies aesthetic. Like it it just feels like an earthy like kitchen. Mm-hmm. Um straight down to just the the curvature of the table and the bench uh seats and, and her and outfit color. And yeah the orange. Yeah. yeah. But I think, yeah, this is like it on paper, at least how they're explaining it feels very like Norman Bates and his mother sort of thing, yes, which is always a very disturbing uh situation. But I think what they might be trying to do here um with the writing is showing you know we always get those backstories of the people who left the empire and joined the rebellion, and we get a lot of good guy backstories on the trauma that led them to wanting to hate the empire and stuff. I think they're flipping it and maybe giving us you know this is why this guy is in this situation and it's it comes from like a bad parent who is still in your life and hasn't abandoned you and and what that does to you versus the parent who abandons you and what that does to you so i think it's almost like the the opposite of what we're familiar with in star wars where the parent either dies or leaves and what does that do to that orphan which path do they take this is the opposite like she's staying in your life and you can't get rid of her and she's like sort of like manipulating you controlling you reminding you of how she wants you to be and what type of effect that can have on you and why maybe that type of um dictatorship upbringing would make falling in line for an imperial institution seem seamless and seem like natural and this is what i should be doing and we'll see if that becomes a situation where he gets fed up with it and and we'll see we'll see where where that goes but it also Stage seems like mother from hell is how he describes this character right right mm. and it's it's funny because they say pretty clearly in a lot of this uh literature about promoting the show is that this guy and this unit is obsessed with finding Cassian Andor so it feels a little um cat and mouse and I like that for for the spy aspect of it and it might be feel like you know catch me if you can in Star Wars with uh, maybe a darker uh, tone to it but in that one image and i could be wrong it looks like they're at the door of that home and based on the hair it looks like that woman who we believe is cassian's adopted mother um i could be off on that but it does look like that so do we have a situation where we have another uh parental figure get killed like we we don't mm-hmm. really know but it, it's it's interesting because it feels fresh it, you know we're getting that empire side or that imperial side of seeing how someone was formed uh, and not like on the force side of things so that we have a, you know, a non-force using, as far as we know, human who just works for the company, so to speak. And how did their um, really strict and, and controlling upbringing make this just a smooth transition right into horribleness? And I think that's going to be uh, provocative because it feels like something we haven't really gotten a lot in Star Wars, especially. Well, I'm sure in books we may have seen that in Throne books and stuff, but uh, this this feels fresh and it feels like a cool another angle of looking at the Empire versus what feels tired to me, which is they were for the Empire, but then they rebelled. It's like, mm-hmm. yeah, wait, everyone did that. Han Solo yeah. did that. We had, Galen yeah, Erso did that. Like it, it's rare that we have a character that is for the Empire. That like is almost re- reluctantly for the Empire. <laughs> I don't know. It's kind of hard to explain, but yeah, we usually have like a character that's like totally for it until they find out that it's maybe not great, and then they rebel or they just die. Yeah. They die. The yeah. bad Empire right. guy. We never have somebody who like. Um, I mean, the closest we probably have is like Kylo Ren, for instance. Right? It seems like he's trying to prove himself, and by doing so, he's he's joining the dark side and he keeps Mm -hmm. going the bad route the the Mm -hmm. wrong way the wrong choice every time so having another character here who's like sort of being driven down by their mother and being told you know they're not good enough and so they try to prove themselves by you know keep doing this thing over and over and over again and it's the wrong thing and um i don't know i i do really like the angle of this i think it's interesting too on this second picture 
You know, it shows him next to that other guy. That other guy's in every episode. Like, yeah. I, I remember finding that out when we go to the IMDb. He's literally in 12 episodes of Andor. And I'm like, dang, man. Him. him and his sideburns. Yeah. yeah so, like, and doesn't that character is going to have pretty big relevance, the character next to him. And I thought he was the one. Everybody was talking about him. But then I'm like, I think the other guy is more important. And I think he technically is more important. But the other guy's definitely getting him screen time. I think he's his boss. Kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So the guy, the guy we're talking about here, um, Cyril Karn is the boss, and this yes. other guy reports to him. He's yes. like his, his like Underling. the other guy's Kira, but this is his, Maul, sort of. Yeah, he does his dirty work or whatever. He's his right hand man, sort of thing. And but he, you know, Solar mentions the word. Uh, he compares it to Dickens, and mm-hmm. it just makes me think: like, are we getting that? trajectory where he is this like horrible person but then he has a, a moment where he someone shows him humanity or or you know like what what your life is going to be and and he has a, a yeah cuz he's uh, specifically talking about this character's trajectory he says right so yeah. is he going to turn which would be fine cuz i like the freshness of seeing why he is the way he is now so i think that's cool mhm um yeah. let's see anything else anything that pops out to you I mean, all the stuff above uh, that you guys said, um, I'm saying above because I'm looking at the article as I'm talking about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Catherine Hunter's looks pure evil, like with the hairdo and the outfit, like she looks like an evil mom, <laughs> I'm, like nervous looking at her. But it's interesting because in Harry Potter, she plays a good person. So I'm interested to see the, the flip of her playing a bad guy. And it's always mm-hmm. they always say it's more fun to play a bad guy. So. Uh, yeah. I don't know. There's just something about mother, motherly characters that are evil that make them even that much more evil. Being a mother myself, like the fact that you could ever be mean to your child or to a child after you've gone through that is just like a whole nother level of evil. Um, but I actually really enjoyed hearing what Tony Gilroy had to say or how they talked about Tony Gilroy's writing and about how yep. he has this big tapestry of life in these characters. And uh, like John said, he compares it to like Charles Dickens and uh, it's just, it's interesting. It feel, I feel like everybody always says that like, Oh, the story's so great. And you know, the producing is great and the directing is great when they're trying to promote a show. But I mm-hmm. feel like every actor and or person attached to the show that's gotten into the details of the writing have all described this as like the most epic tale that they've ever read. Um, And as we know from Rogue One, Tony is totally capable of giving us an epic tale and an epic story that's going to sit with us for a long time. And that's why Rogue One trends all the time on social media. That's a good point, Lacey. Like, I feel like what we've, we've often got out of the actors involved in Star Wars projects is like, hey, are you excited? And they're like, of course I'm excited. I look around and come on set. It's Star Wars. Who wouldn't right. want to be? You know, and it's always well, like lightsaber. the excitement yeah. behind the project is that it's Star Wars. And sure, they say that these things like, you know, Deborah Chow is like great. I love working with her and all this other stuff. Yeah, yeah. But this does legitimately feel like they are, they're not excited that it's Star Wars. They're excited that they're working on Tony Gilroy, his next project. Because yes. he wrote something really cool with really great characters and side note, it happens to be set in the Star Wars universe. Right, exactly. That's the yeah. difference Bingo. there. Yeah. And that's why I think like I, I've always gotten the vibe from this show that there was going to be something special to it. Like it was going to be like, don't get me wrong, Star Wars fans and Star Wars people, like casual fans, love The Mandalorian, you know, mm-hmm. Book mm-hmm. of Boba Fett, Obi-Wan Kenobi. That stuff's great. I think this show is going to be the critical show. The critical response is going to be like, well, as a television, the piece of film, like Rogue One was, it's just going to be the best yeah. one. Like it's, yeah. it, it's the storytelling, the characters, it's all there. Um, as a Star Wars movie, fans might not be like, okay, you know, it's not the best. I didn't feel like uh, it was Obi Wan and Vader, but it was. Sure good as a piece of story or something like that and i think that i think star wars should have that too you know and that I, i'm glad i'm so glad the show's getting made i think that is a good descriptor though as there are stories that are good star wars stories 
and then there are good stories that mm. are set in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And I feel oftentimes a lot of the stuff we've been getting, like Obi-Wan Kenobi and Book of Boba Fett, is a good Star Wars story. But some of the stuff that you see with Mando is a good story regardless if it's in Star Wars or not. And mm -hmm. I think that this is what, like you were just saying, James, this is definitely one of those ones that it doesn't necessarily have to be in Star Wars. It's just a good story. Yeah, like that. that's how I was feeling about some of the books too. Like I, I read the the Brotherhood book, you mm -hmm. know, that had Obi-Wan and I was like, it's fine. It feels like a Clone Wars episode, you know? Sure. The, I, it just, it wasn't anything great. It just felt like another story with Anakin and Obi-Wan and, you know, it was just, it, sure. it was okay, you know? It was fine. But then there's these other stories and fa fans know like Lost Stars is usually the one that everybody picks out. It's like, right. I didn't have to know any of those characters. Those were all brand new characters. It just happened to be set in Star Wars. The story was what was good. Like the way those characters interacted with each other, their upbringings and how they turned out and what happened in their lives. That's why people go to that book. But and... it could have been any war, any story. Yeah, any, yeah it yeah. could have, but they were just like, the faction she I mean it was sort of Romeo and Juliet the faction she ends up with is this side the faction he ends up with is on that side and um and it was it was just really good but and and I'm going to slip this in here real quick where the heck is Lost Stars 2 who's holding that up <laughs> we're six book yeah. we're six thrawn books in and probably to this day that's still the most critically acclaimed book we have and it's not written yet <laughs> so what is going on <laughs> You know? I need to go but back anyway, and reread it. I've been uh, yeah. thinking about that. I, I, yeah, Gilroy is That the ends right on a cliffhanger, guy. too. I know. I know. It's nuts that they haven't, they haven't said anything about it. It's like fans gave up asking Claudia about it because she's just going to be please. like, she's going to be like, side note, High Republic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think like, the, the, okay. actors got, the actors got too old, unfortunately. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, with his blonde hair is a little... D dirty yeah. blonde now so it doesn't work some guy in the youtube comments it's a book you idiot yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> these guys don't know anything about star wars and then he hears Try then he hears me say that and he deletes his comment and he thinks yeah. of something else to write yeah. um but tony gilroy's the right guy for this uh dark star wars you know this uh this really like messed up who's on what side oh, i'm gonna be so like, hurt by this show and well, that's the thing like and you know, we have a you know our discussion coming up um, that we're going to have on on Thursday is going to be very interesting when you put that up against this. But like you, to Tony Gilroy is not going to write the movie that has the yub nub at the end and and that <laughs> sort of Star Wars feeling. <laughs> like he's y he's the guy who's writing this exact stuff. He's the right guy for this time period. Um, I'm not saying he's like trapped here. Like I'm sure if he wants to come back and do other Star Wars that uh, has this sort of darker tone. He's I would perfect bet for it, but... he's the one that's like, yo, Kathleen, can I kill them? Can I kill all the characters? <laughs> and Kathleen was yeah. like, sure, I nope. guess. I think I think I, I could be wrong, but I think it was Kathleen Kennedy who said we have to kill the characters. Oh, yeah. Did she yeah. say you had to kill them? I she, thought yeah. she said yeah. that they asked her to kill them, and she said no, that they were no, no. At, She's at the... the one who said, like, they got to die. <laughs> so the, the story goes, and I don't know who it was, like, whether it was Gareth Edwards or, like, the writers or whoever. Originally, they that... didn't die, and then she stepped in and was like, yeah, kill they, them. Or they yeah. thought it was, they were like, this is Disney, let's write this story, and they presented that first article, and she was the one that was like, I read it, and it was like, fine, but, like, it doesn't, how are you going to explain the, I, I would have assumed they'd all die at the end. And they were like, oh, can we do that? And she's like, yeah. <laughs> It was like that kind of yeah. story. Um, and don't forget, like, I haven't seen this movie, and I really should now. Like, Michael Rogue Clayton. One? <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen Rogue One. Um, well, it's back in theaters, John. We're not talking about it, but yeah. Go see it. Oh, yeah. Um, Michael Clayton in t uh, 2007, you know, he was nominated for Best Director, Best Screenplay. Um, a lot of these, you know, big awards that he didn't win. I was trying to think. I think he they lost in No Country for Old Men. I think that's. I believe that's what it was. But Boo. no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the movie's amazing. <laughs> well, no, he lost screenplay to Juno. Um, so I mean, but either way, he was nominated, mm -hmm. and yeah, Best Picture went to No Country for Old Men. Whatever. But the fact that you know we have this guy making Star Wars who was nominated for directing and writing, um, at, at the Oscars is is a big deal, and he. 
like we said, doesn't love Star Wars, so he doesn't feel the pressure. He's just like, I'm this is here's the deal. Let's keep phrase I keep like saying. Like so it's I'm excited that he has that confidence and I think he's the right guy for this tone and this this type of Star Wars. My favorite quote was the one that he gave when they talked about Rogue One. He was just like, I don't like it. So I came in and I just gutted it. Yeah. <laughs> like, I yeah. just loved that. Like, l- the, yeah. the confidence of like, hey, I don't care about this. Like, the yeah. confidence you have to have to tell Star Wars fans <laughs> that you don't care. That you're like, I it's don't like, care. It's like when you... And this is like a scene in Swingers, like John Favreau wrote, but it's so true. And mm-hmm. if you follow me, you'll, it'll make sense, I hope. It's like when you go through a breakup and you're the one who gets broken up with, you do like everything you can to try to get that person back. And it never works. But like sometimes the moment you stop caring, the person like comes back around. And that's like Tony Gilroy. He's like, I don't care. And that's why this works. Like, it's almost like the people who care too much Mm. about making Star Wars, like, second guess themselves and overthink things. And he's just like, I'm telling this story. Bam. You're going to like it. If not, too freaking bad. Mm. Here it is. I mean, I love it. That's always kind of been a thing, too. Like, I I think one of the classic examples that I heard people talk about is the Dungeons and Dragons movie. Not the new one that's coming out, but like the old one. People said it was written and put together by people who just knew the lore and the game. They loved it so much that they just didn't make a good movie. Yeah. <laughs> like, right. And it was so, just like yeah. they just got too involved in like, oh, oh yeah. what could we do in this? And then it just was mm-hmm. like, yeah, but you didn't make a good movie. <laughs> you know? Right. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, right. All right. We got one more thing to talk about, and that is visions, right? Uh, we know a little bit about that uh, there's going to be a second season and we know a little bit about how they're expanding that to more than just Japanese anime. They are now going worldwide. And we got an interview here uh, with, uh, from Deadline as the producer, the executive producer addresses the decision to actually move that beyond uh, just Japan. They're going to have a Japan, but they're also going to have a bunch of other countries, including the United States, so that could be kind of interesting. But uh, they're also going to be included in the United Kingdom, Spain, France, South Africa, India, and South Korea, uh, Chile, and Ireland. Lots of lots of different places. Um, as he gets into it, he basically says, well, of course, the first anthology is anime because we all love the style of it, but personally, my intention for Visions was to always let it be more of a broad palette because there's so much great animation work going on in the world uh john you're up first on this one is there any thoughts on the volume two of visions being a global uh take i mean i'm not very well versed in anime so i'm not my my thoughts on this are going to be pretty brief i'm just thinking if they're opening up the talent pool so much i wonder if they're not like trying to fit the bookshelf so to speak where it's like the neatly placed volume one then volume two looks just like it and stuff like maybe the first set of episodes the nine or whatever it was is fine there but then they're going to hit us with like here's 24 shorts of visions because we have studios in japan working on it we have people here working on it people here working on it maybe they're really just opening this thing up more where it's not season one season two season three Mm -hmm. they're not inhibited by uh canon ties which i i like that they're able to just tell what they want fans can't get too up in arms about it because it's whatever uh they don't necessarily need to trade notes unless they're talking about the same characters so they don't have to worry about is that studio done that is that a final cut because then my story won't make sense they really have this open palette and 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 i that freedom to just uh, from a schedule standpoint and a creative standpoint to do what they want so my first thought was, if they're opening up to so many different studios all over the world, maybe they're really just ma- going to make a bunch of these and have them ready to go. So that's that's all I got. Uh, I'm glad that people love Visions. I enjoyed it. It was sort of like my gateway into uh, anime because I never really liked anime for some reason, um, the the style. But because it was Star Wars, it sort of made me appreciate it a bit more. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm, I'm eager to see what else they come up with. But I'll defer to to Lacey. I think she knows a, a bit more about this type of stuff, this type of animation than I do. But 
I just think they're going to maybe give us some more stuff since they're widening the net of the talent pool. One one quick thing that I noticed, if I'm not mistaken, there was nine episodes of Vision to begin with. And the, as they say, not just Japan, but they go on to name eight other countries. So it yeah. looks like nine episodes uh, will be the, it'll be the same night. It'll be nine episodes is all I'm trying maybe. to get out there. The only thing I could think is that some of the studios did two or three episodes each. Yeah. So they might I, th do more. That is, that's possible. Like, um, one thing I was thinking was just coming off of the original season of Visions, it felt mm -hmm. like fans really wanted to see the ninth Jedi uh, yep. be, be told and that be the one story that goes on, and including the people who worked on it. But then it felt to me that visions like if there was a producer at the top that was like well we're gonna we're gonna keep visions moving on they're all gonna be different stories but the one story that moves on was always ronin because it seems like there's a special place for that because it's like it's the first story it was like they i think they revealed that a little bit earlier they made the book i think they did like a, a an adaptation comic or something to it I, I might be wrong on that but i felt like there was something else they did and so it felt like Ronin is the one that carries through. So if Japan only does one story in this, do, does Ronin move on or does the Ninth Jedi move on? I don't know. It's kind of interesting. Lacey, what are your thoughts on the second season or volume two, I should say, of Visions? Um, well, I am a big anime fan, so I did like the first season being all anime inspired. Um, it brought back a lot of like childhood stuff, nostalgia, and then as well as, you know, I love um, any Studio Ghibli stuff. So yeah, uh, some of that stuff also kind of looked reminiscent of that as well. It is exciting that they're doing more countries for the second season because I feel like there's just so many different types of animation that branch off anime or branch off other different inspirations that you don't have people looking at it and saying, oh, I don't want to get into that because it's because it's anime. And I feel like people get overwhelmed when they see things that are anime related because they're like, oh, I'm never going to get into this. Whereas yeah. people love Pixar, people love Disney, people love all different types of animation. So I think this kind of will widen that net to show more talent, different types of technology and animation, um, kind of what we're already seeing with Pixar anyway, with their shorts that go before their movies. It's basically the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, I also think there's a, a piece of this that's playing into um, the Oscars. So they did submit some of these, the Village Bride, to the Oscars. If they get all these different countries, I'm assuming they could not only submit for short feature, but they could submit for international feature of like foreign language feature if they mm -hmm. do it in foreign language. Mm -hmm. um, so they just have more opportunities, I'm assuming, to, to submit. Um, but... I'm just so pumped they're doing another season of this. I really enjoyed the first one. James, you say this all the time, and I completely agree with you. I think it just came and left so quickly that we didn't Massively even get a chance. Underrated. Yeah, we didn't even get a chance to really take it in and discuss it and talk about it. Um, it was just here and then gone. And I was one of the people that was lucky enough to see the screeners before mm -hmm. the show came out. So I was blowing through these uh, episodes to, try to, get, them done, to yeah. get them done. And then you know, I haven't really gone back to them. I've gone back to a couple, but I haven't really been able to sit through them like I would have if they did one a week. And I feel like oftentimes stuff like this doesn't get the same treatment as a bigger piece of media, or I shouldn't say bigger, a longer piece of media or live action. Um, when the amount of work and time that goes into these isn't any different. Um, yeah. I just hope that they get more time in between the episodes, but I'm a They'll probably put them all out at once again. And I, that's, I, I, that drives me nuts. I'm like, mm -hmm. I just don't understand why you wouldn't space these out. And I get it. You've got a huge laundry list of Disney properties, but I, I subscribe to a thing where every Tuesday, or maybe it's every Wednesday, I can't remember if it's on the day or the day before, but I get a, a notification to go to this website and it tells me all the new stuff that's coming out on Disney+. Plus. And it's usually like, oh, they added season two of Phineas and Ferb. Um, there's this new movie that they put out. Uh, also, this is one Sneakerella cartoon. Is out yet? <laughs> no, apparently it is. Apparently we missed it. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> but I, I look at that stuff and I go, okay, so that's Disney's release for this week. And I'm like, I just don't understand how for nine weeks they couldn't just be like, and also Visions episode four, you know, whatever. 
Like it just really does not seem that crazy. It's not like it's competing with any of this other stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, it really blows my mind. And I, I think that um, I, I said underrated. I don't think it's underrated. I think it's overlooked. I think people forget about it. I saw something on, on Reddit just the other day of somebody posting and they said, what is this from? And it was a screenshot from something of visions. And it's like, all the comments were like, oh, that's Visions. It's on Disney Plus. You should check it out. But I was like, how do you know? It's amazing to me that Star Wars fans, th they come across something and they're like, what is that? I've never seen that before. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like, mm -hmm. it's just because it came out and like in the course of a week or two, everybody forgot about it. Um, they were already moving on to the next thing. Yeah. yeah. But I've talked about that before. The one thing I wanted to say about this, besides the fact that it looked like there would be nine episodes as well to me is I do really like the idea that they're expanding out of Japan because as much as I liked all the different versions of the stories, they all felt Japanese culture based. So a lot of them were like, Oh, you know, well, George Lucas really likes samurais and stuff. And that's all where we, you know, what made star Wars, what it was. So we're going to lean into that and we're kind of going to show you samurai and, and we're, um, and that type of Japanese culture in these things. But I'm like, I'm looking at some of these other ones, especially these ones in Europe, and I'm like, oh, like King Arthur, like knights and castles and stuff. I'm like, that could be really cool because it's not so much about the style of animation from Spain and France. It is. But again, but these stories are supposed to be about how those countries culturally tell their stories through the lens yeah, of Star of Wars. Star Wars, yeah. These yep. are South Korean stories. These are Indian stories that are culturally relevant to them, the, these types of characters, these types of stories, and they're being retold in that Star Wars world that we were kind of talking about with Tony Gilroy earlier. So I'm like, cool, let me see French Star Wars. Like, what are some tales that they hold dear retwisted into the star wars uh aesthetic yeah. i I'm, like i that can't wait a lot because that, visions did feel very japanese sure. based all of it from did. the cherry and it felt blossoms right because it was, and the buildings yeah it felt right because it was star wars but also it it really makes me wonder like wow what is south africa gonna be like that's so cool i want to see mm -hmm. that so mm -hmm. Anyway, let me um, see. A, let me see a lightsaber duel with a couple of baguettes. Exactly. How about a crepe? <laughs> a crepe. Yeah, it came full circle. All yeah. right. Uh, who throws a crepe? Honestly. <laughs> All right. Uh, that is going to be it for Resistance Report this week. We do have another segment that we want to get into. Uh, Lacey, if you want to take it away. All right, guys. It's time for the Patreon Pod Race. So there are lots of ways you can support us. You can like this comment or like this video, comment, subscribe. You can like a comment. You can like a comment too. Uh, follow us on Twitter at RBATSWNN or on Instagram at The Resistance Broadcast. But if you like what we're doing here, talking about crepes and much more, you can head over to patreon.com slash resistance broadcast. Uh, starting at $2 a month, that's it. $2. It's cheaper than a crepe. Uh, you can support our show and watch exclusive content, yeah. join our Discord, and much more as you go up in the ranks. This is the part of the show that we let our generals and spice runners take part. We ask them a question. They give us their answer. We discuss. Um, but before we get to that, I do want to thank those people. So thank you to our generals. Carmelo, John Reese, Jetta Rosewater, Paul Olson, Frank Grande, Darth Hurricane, John Charlton, Nick Kratz, Christian Morales, Brian Smith, Matt Chitty, Danny, Mike Ramori, Matt Heath. Chris White, Brendan McLaughlin, Count Pepto, Samuel Zilke, and Val Trichkoff. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. And to our Spice Runners, David Probus, Neil Shaw, Kendall Gelnar, Ryan Wara, Dave Hornack, Micah Harrison, Thomas Hennessy, Andrew Staley, and Jeremy Myers. Thank you guys for keeping it spicy. Thank you. So this week, we have a Spice Runner, Dave Hornack, a.k.a. Indie Dave, our buddy. Um, and we asked him another Dave, Dave Filoni recently said Star Wars should make people happy. What about Star Wars gives you that feeling the most? Dave, take it away. Hey, Bass. Well, I'm a 54-year-old guy, and I first saw Star Wars when I was 10. So 44 years of my life have been consumed by the magic that is. And whether it be the stories that unfold through books the theater screens, the TV now, video games, 
or the stories of real life, uh, seeing it with my grandmother for the first time, my wife uh, who was dating me, dressing up as Princess Leia, the stories that are to be had, um, the music, the emotions, um, leading me to YouTube a few years back, and of course this great community that I'm involved in now. Uh, what makes me happy? All of that. Emotion, music, stories, good versus evil, Star Wars. And I love that I have a community to share it in the resistance space. May the force be with all of you. Nice job, Dave. Awesome to mm -hmm. see you. John, what did you think of his answer? Uh, it was... I was I'm envious as to how easy it was for you to say almost everything, um, <laughs> you know, like, and it feels genuine, you know, and you, you, you come across that way that you really uh, focus on the, the, the little things and the joys in life. And I appreciate that a lot, Dave. Um, so, yes, it's the fact that you saw Star Wars when you were 10 and you have all these memories uh, of experiencing the story, but also how you bring up the fact that you have fond memories of experiencing it in real life with others. I think that's uh, really cool. And it seems like you find things to enjoy in all aspects of what comes from Star Wars. So um, it's, hard, it's hard to say uh, anything bad about the answer. Um, I, I know I asked you about that second poster behind you that looks uh sort of sci-fi and, and a little uh throwback so i need you to remind me of the story on that because um i like the original poster that you have on the left there but i want to hear you gotta refresh my memory about that second one uh, but great answer as always man uh you just i i wish you were on celebration because i know we would have such a good time hanging out and sharing weird drinks. Uh, you probably would have convinced me to try things i probably wouldn't have otherwise but <laughs> maybe one day so until then Cheers. James? Yeah, I mean, I like it, it's so great that you love everything, the music, the emotions, I think is what you said. Like I think there's uh the the other cool thing is just like it it it's very flattering that you say, you know, it's it, the TRB community and stuff too. I mean, that that it's one thing like when we try to kind of we're like, <laughs> we love Star Wars, maybe other people will like it with us, you know what I mean? And it's just nice to hear that somebody says like Hey man, that's one of the positives that that I like about Star Wars. Is I like that there's good Star yeah. Wars community out there. It, it, it really meant a lot, um, Dave. So I I appreciate that. Um, I I think you have a very good answer as far as like every every aspect of Star Wars is a good thing because if it if it wasn't, you know, if you hated the stories, <laughs> you really liked the music, but you hated the stories, you probably wouldn't be a big Star Wars fan. So it it kind of in some way means yeah, it's got to be everything. That's what makes me big star wars fan because of all franchises all of it makes me happy that's why it's my number one you know kind of thing i just want to mention too just real quick because i saw that jack skellington figure in the back i'm going to mickey's not so scary halloween coming up and i had a co-worker that just went and they said that they waited in line for two hours to meet jack and sally and it's Holy a five God. hour event and cost them four hundred dollars <laughs> cost him four hundred dollars to go to the event it was five hours long and they spent two of it waiting for jack and sally i'm like and then it rained it rained on the first night so the hocus pocus show at the end got canceled oh my gosh i anyway. also have to say that i've been seeing james non-stop tweet about how he's going to the halloween party non-stop i think i put one tweet out I've seen you respond to That's multiple enough, things, including James. mine, Thank being you. like, I can't wait to see this oh, at the scary oh, party. I did do Matt that Martin, one too. you were like, I'm going to be at Those the scary are the two. party. Those are the two. I've, I've not even tweeted about it. I've replied to two tweets <laughs> that I've mentioned it. But hey, I'm excited. I, no, I've I'm always wanted to go, you. and I always got not stuck, but like we always ended up going to the Christmas one. I was like, I want to go to the, the Halloween, Halloween one. The Halloween one is fun. Matt and it's I went for our honeymoon. Right? It was... Yeah be prepared to leave with a ton of candy like too be much candy prepared. it's a lot like especially if you go to the area that's like the circusy area that's like past mm -hmm. the dumbos or whatever or like past like there's a whole little area right there where they give out candy at every step and no one oh, goes back oh. there uh 
it, it's fantasy land it's called circus uh cir- t- the yeah. top top hat circus yeah or something. so if yeah. you go through that building there they'll give you candy but because no one goes back there you end mm. up taking handfuls like they're like giving you because they want to get rid of the candy yeah so you're leaving with so much candy it's I wonder ridiculous why I would be excited it's it's really fun. We anyway. we had a great time. It was it was really. Fun. But yeah, the character stuff is crazy. If you want to meet characters, like you're gonna be waiting for a while. But <laughs> ridiculous. Other than that, it's just to walk around with the the Halloween theme. That was it's after just a they, guy in a suit. That's after they erased our our magic bands and almost <laughs> lost our tickets, and I almost cried. <laughs> It's just a figure in the background of this pod race, and yet we're still like right. focused on the wrong thing. Dave, anyway. thank you. Thank you so much for doing it. Thank you for being a patron. Thank you for being a uh, spice runner. It's nuts, man. You're awesome, and you know you're awesome, so there you go. Yeah, Dave, I didn't mean to like go down on a crazy rant with that. <laughs> it was just a really fun event, and it's getting around uh, Halloween time, which means that it's getting closer to Christmas, which is my favorite mm. time of year. Um, I can't wait. Anyway, um, yeah, your answer was great. I love everything about Star Wars as well. And I think this community, our community, but like the Star Wars community as a whole has made my Star Wars experience better. We talked about found family on that episode, which is one of my favorite episodes ever. If you've never heard it, go back and wa- like watch, listen. Um, but the Star Wars community is the reason that I've gotten so into Star Wars on top of already being a big fan. Um, so it's mm. nice to hear other people feel the same way. Thank you so much for your answer. Sorry we went on a little bit of a rant. If you want to hear more about the uh, our Disney adventures, maybe to join our Patreon. Maybe we'll have to do a video about it. Um, but yeah, back to you, John. All right. Yeah, that pretty much takes to the end of the show. Um, real quick, just want to, before we get out of here, uh, say thank you to everyone who has been listening and watching and being a part of TRB as uh, Lacey just said, and James as well, the, the, the community is uh, a special thing to all of us. And it still to this day, you know, we've been doing this, the three of us together for over four years now, it still blows us away that how many people um, just hang with us and, and love what we do. It's, it's crazy and it's awesome. So I, I just want to thank you uh, personally for that. Um, make sure you do uh, subscribe your preferred platforms and, and spread the word. Spreading the word is huge. So if you know anyone who likes Star Wars, especially with Andor coming up, uh, anyone who, who in your family who likes Rogue One, maybe that's the only Star Wars they like, they're excited about Andor, tell them about the podcast. We're going to be going live doing doing shows talking about Andor. So so tell your buddies, tell your friends, and spread the word and have them come join us in the base. It's always a better time. Uh, Star Wars News Net for all of your Star Wars news reviews, editorials, information, and more. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, Johnny Hoey, writing and editing at StarWarsNewsNet.com. And uh, just like the movies, is back tomorrow. We had a hiatus because me and Mike were hanging out, but we're doing Dirty Harry, Clint Eastwood, tomorrow. Um, and I'm going to send it to James Beanie. Uh, Twitter and Instagram, at Myra Trunks, is where you can find me, always talking about Star Wars. And Lacey, before you do your socials, mm. uh, what's your favorite Radiohead song? I have a guess. I don't know. Is it? Are you gonna make a crepe joke with creep? Yeah. All right. Terrible. You can find That's me terrible. on Twitter and Instagram at Lacey Geller, and where I won't be yeah. making jokes like that. Was that was the lover. joke just crepe? <laughs> yeah. Not joke. It's not even like as I crepe or whatever. Like the song title. He, he would be. didn't it was even just try. Crepe. He didn't even. Try I should have just. I should have just said anything else. Yeah, just, not even great because it was too obvious. That, yeah, <clears throat> I'm gonna check to see if Crepe Lover is available on Twitter for Lacey to change her handle. Um, all right, we'll be back Thursday where we're gonna talk about feeling good and uh, do we need some more Star Wars stories that make us hopeful? So we'll just leave you with that. You'll learn more about what we're getting to on Thursday morning. But until then, enjoy your weeks, and we'll see you next time right here on TRB. See you around, kids.